In this clip, we see a formation of B-24 bombers under attack by German FW-190s. The bomber interceptors are approaching from the rear and firing both machine guns and autocannon projectiles. The intent of this video is to compare bomber versus fighter armament theory and upgrades adopted throughout the war and address which weapons platform could muster more firepower, a B-17 bomber or an FW-190. We will focus on the FW-190 since this fighter was Germany's main frontline bomber interceptor. This can be partially justified by this chart identifying German aircraft claims shot down by bomber gunners from a declassified 1945 document titled Statistical Summary of 8th Air Force Operations European Theater, August 1942 through May 1945. 8th Air Force bomber gunners claimed 3,107 FW-190 shot down out of the 6,259 total claims, or 49.6%. More FW-190s were shot down by bomber gunners than any other German model. Bomber versus fighter armaments philosophy is described on this page from a 1945 United States Strategic Survey report titled Armaments in the Air War, 1939-1945. Bomber armaments were selected to attain ideal minimum firepower. That is not a typo. Ideal minimum firepower is desired, not maximum. Armaments need to be minimized due to their detrimental effect on bombing performance. Carrying heavy guns, ammo, and gunners had a detrimental effect on range, maneuverability, and bomb load. Bombers should maximize range and bomb load while having reasonable firepower. Bomber and fighter trends are discussed on this page. A bomber's gunner's target is small, fast, and maneuverable. This makes gun sight target tracking difficult. A bomber interceptor, on the other hand, will have less struggles in tracking large, slow, lumbering, straight-flying bombers. However, it is difficult to inflict sufficient firepower to destroy a battle-damage-resistant bomber like the B-17. This necessitated German bomber interceptors to continually upsize their armaments as the war progressed. The bombers focused on better gun sights and methods to deal with small, fast-moving targets while fighters upsize their bomber-destroying firepower. This is why you see compensating and reflecting gun sights added to the late war B-17s at the waist and tail positions in lieu of the standard 35 mil rad ring and beat gun sights. To summarize the principal philosophies, bombers will carry sufficient armaments to defend against fighters that penetrated the escorts. No more, no less. German fighters will be equipped with maximum armaments to destroy bombers. This table lists characteristics of the various German and Allied aircraft guns used in World War II. These four rows highlight the armaments adopted by the FW-190. These two rows are the machine guns and these two rows are the autocannons. The late war B-17s exclusively adopted the Browning 50 caliber machine gun in this row. This chart provides a relative destructive effect of German armaments on bombers. The y-axis is a projectile's caliber size in millimeters. The top row denotes the destructive effect of the projectile. The images in the body of the chart are the gun's name and the projectile's cross-section. The German MG-17 machine gun firing 7.92mm caliber bullets will have a negligible effect on a B-17 bomber. A 7.92mm bullet is roughly the same size as a US-30 or British 303 caliber bullet. The MG-131 machine gun firing a 13mm caliber bullet will have an effect on the bomber if the round is incendiary. A 13mm bullet is roughly the same size as a US-50 caliber bullet. Each MG-151 autocannon firing a 20mm caliber projectile is capable of destroying 6% of the bomber per hit, or around 17 strikes for complete bomber destruction. Each MK-108 autocannon firing a 30mm caliber projectile is capable of destroying 25% of the bomber per hit, or around 4 strikes for complete destruction. And lastly, a single R4M air-to-air -air rocket will destroy a bomber on one hit. See the channel's German 20mm, 30mm, and R4M rocket videos for additional information on these weapons. This chart outlines German fighter armament upsizing as the war progressed. The first column is the year of operation. The subsequent columns are the fighter and the respective armaments. The seven FW-190 armament mixes are in this column. The FW-190 started out with four MG-17 machine guns firing the underpowered 7.92mm caliber round. Two MG-151 20mm autocannons were added in addition to keeping two MG-17 machine guns, two MG-131 larger caliber machine guns, and four 20mm autocannons. This schematic shows the placement of these armaments from a 1944 FW-190 aircraft handbook. 
The MG-131 13mm machine guns are located here and shoot through the fighter's propeller. The four 20mm autocannons are located here in the wing box. Two MG-131 machine guns, two 20mm autocannons, and two 30mm autocannons. This image shows the autocannon mountings. Two MG-131 machine guns and six 20mm autocannons. This image shows the configuration mountings of the 20mm autocannons. Lastly, this FW-190 sported two MG-131 machine guns, two MG-151 20mm autocannons, and four MK-108 30mm autocannons. The MK-108 30mm autocannon was considered to be the best armament for anti-bomber attacks. An additional evaluation on the effectiveness of the MK-108 is given on this page from a 1947 United States Strategic Bombing Survey report titled Japanese Air Weapons and Tactics. The most efficient aircraft cannon is the 30mm MK-108. Vulnerability of bombers to the MK-108 has been clearly demonstrated in the European theater. The armaments evolution of the B-17 bomber is shown on this table from a September 1945 AAF Air Technical Service Command document titled Tactical Planning. The columns reflect the number and caliber of gun, rounds per gun, and location of guns. Additional guns were added as the war progressed, but the largest armament effect was swapping out the ring bead sights for reflector and or compensating gun sights and the addition of 100% belted armor-piercing incendiary ammo. The two main factors in reducing bomber losses to fighters were the addition of the long-range fighter escort and flying in formation. The advantages of flying in formation are listed on this page from a 1945 Central School for Flexible Gunnery document titled Gunnery in the B-29, the Tactical Use of Equipment. Planes are arranged in Formation 2. Ease of flyability. Allow pilots to fly safely in their formation position. Deliver bombs on target as accurately as possible. Allow the maximum amount of formation zonal gun coverage. The best formation to defend against fighters is to stack the bombers one on top of each other but the bombs cannot be released in this formation and it would be difficult to fly in a vertical stack. This configuration would be equivalent to the maritime crossing the T broadside attack. If a plane falls out of formation, they lose the mutual firepower protection the formation provided and you become a straggler. On some missions, 50% of bomber losses were stragglers, as highlighted on this page from a 1945 8th Air Force's tactical development document. So how would a B-17 straggler fare against a single FW-190? We can look at the applied firepower of each weapons platform as shown in this chart. The x-axis is a year of operational service. The y-axis is the platform's firepower, where firepower is defined as the bullet or projectile's destructive coefficient times the number of guns times the rate of fire. Assume the FW-190 is attacking the B-17 at the 5 o'clock high direction and the B-17 can aim in this direction, two tail guns, two upper turret guns, and a single radio room gun. Since no additional rear-facing bomber guns were added to this quadrant direction, the bomber's firepower line is horizontal at a value of 60. This line represents the FW-190's firepower peaking at 236. Each of the seven FW-190 armament upgrades can be identified by the change in firepower slope. Observations of the chart. The FW-190 continually dramatically increased its bomber-killing armaments throughout the war. FW-190s exceeded firepower parity with the B-17s at the start of 1943, and by the end of the war well exceeded the B-17's firepower by a factor of 3.9. In summary, B-17 bombers increased their firepower slightly, but could never bring more than five guns to bear in any one direction. Bomber armament efforts were expended on better gun sites to help in target tracking. The FW-190 increased their firepower by an order of magnitude during the war. The key to bomber survival was staying in formation, taking advantage of the mutual protection provided. To match the firepower of an FW-190, a straggling bomber would need 20 50 caliber machine guns bearing in the fighter's direction. This firepower parity can only come through mutual defense support flying formation. If you found this FW-190 versus B-17 firepower deep dive review worthy of your time, please consider engaging with the video by liking, commenting, and or subscribing to the channel, World War II U.S. Bombers.